Okay, everybody, I'm just now going to hand over uh, to Sarah, and uh, we're really grateful to her for having agreed to do this tonight. Hello, everybody. Uh, great to have you join us um, here at four o'clock on the day before bank holiday weekend. So as somebody said, that's quite dedicated. <laughs> Um, thanks to um, Helen and Gregor for inviting me to, to come along and, and talk about tunneling. And um, yeah, welcome everybody, and, and I hope you find it useful. So um, let's start with oops, let's start with me getting familiar with the technology. <laughs> um, right. Um, let's start with um, the basics. What do we mean by quantum tunneling? And uh, when I hear quantum tunneling, I have to say it always conjures up this image of um, a quantum particle trying to bore through the Earth somehow. Um, so let, let's start with um, what is quantum tunneling and, and what is it not. Um, so what we mean by quantum tunneling is when a quantum particle can pass through a barrier that classically it wouldn't be able to. Um, so classically, you have this idea if, if you have a, a barrier and a particle approaches that barrier, um, if it has enough energy, it can get over the barrier. Um, quantum mechanically, um, a particle, even that doesn't have enough energy to get over the, this barrier, can sometimes be found on the other side. And so that's the sense in which it's something which would be impenetrable classically. And because we know it doesn't go over the barrier, there's this idea that it must be sort of tunneling through. So this is what we mean by, by quantum tunneling. Um, I'd like to make it uh, sort of as, as natural um, as I can. I'm going to try and make it as, as intuitive as possible. Um, it's really a consequence of the wave-like properties of particles, quantum particles. Um, so once you've accepted that quantum particles have a wave-like nature, which I understand um, is difficult for your students seeing it for the first time, but sort of once you're at that point of accepting that quantum particles sometimes have, have wave-like properties, um, then it's quite natural that tunneling should occur. So I'll, I'll try and explain why, why I think that's the case. So um, this is the sort of image that you um, often see in textbooks talking about quantum tunneling. And this is the, the, the thing that I'll sort of try to deconstruct in the rest of the session. Um, but, but here's the idea. Um, on the right and the left-hand side, um, you have a... So, so, Throughout the, the image, we have a particle which has a certain energy. Um, so usually you think of uh, a set energy being a sum of the potential and kinetic energies. Um, so over here on the left ha left hand side, I turn on the pointer. Uh, over here on the left hand side, um, uh, the particle has more energy than the potential energy there. So it has a positive kinetic energy, which is the difference. Similarly, if the particle can come over here onto the right-hand side, um, it has a positive kinetic energy because the um, total energy is bigger than the potential. Uh, here in the middle, um, the energy this particle has is less than the potential energy of, of the surroundings. And so if the particle were to get in here somehow, it would have to have a negative kinetic energy. And this just isn't allowed classically. So this is what we mean when we say um, classically a uh, particle can't get in here. So what I'd like to do for the, the rest of the session is sort of, as I said, kind of deconstruct this picture. And I want to try and explain what's meant by these sorts of diagrams where we have um, this potential energy diagram. What does that mean? What are some examples of this? And what does it mean um, to be able to tunnel through? So classically, the idea, again, here a, a particle would have a positive kinetic energy, so it's allowed to be here. If it's over here on the other side, it would have a positive kinetic energy, so it's allowed to be here, um, but it can't cross over. Um, so quantum mechanically, a particle can pass from one side to the other, and we'll try and talk a little bit about why, um, why that's possible. Uh, so classically, the particle doesn't have enough energy to make it over this barrier. Um, quantum mechanically, we, we end up with a non-zero probability of finding the particle over on this side. Um, so, so how does it get there? So that's the sort of basics. What is quantum tunneling? And, um, and this, this picture that, that you see of tunneling and trying to deconstruct it. For the rest of the talk, um, I want to start by reminding you of um, why we think quantum particles have a wave-like nature. So I hope that this will follow on quite well from the previous meet on the double slit experiment. 
And so I won't talk too much about um, the wave picture, uh, but just to sort of bring everyone onto the same page, I hope. Um, and then I want to talk a little bit about potential energy diagrams, because it's sort of so important, what does this, what does this image mean? What does this um, potential bump really mean? Uh, and then talk about um, how tunneling occurs, so how quantum tunneling follows from the wave picture of, of quantum mechanics. And then we'll finish with, with quite a few examples um, when I'll try to explain what this uh, potential uh, barrier could be in various different cases and try to give you some physical context for, for what's happening. Okay. Um, so, so just to remind remind you um, or, or give you a place to start with, with your students, um, why do we think quantum particles have a wave-like nature? Uh, because we can see interference effects. And I know you had this meet recently about the double slit experiment. So imagine you have um, uh, an electron gun uh, firing electrons or, or quantum particles at a double slit. Um, we know, so let me just turn on the pointer, um, we know from an experiment, from observational evidence, that over here on the observing screen, um, we'll see an interference pattern. So this gives evidence for the wave-like nature of quantum particles. And because what's adding over here is not the probability that the electron went through one slit or went through the other, but the amplitudes for those two possibilities. So it's, it's just analogous to um, the, the, the similar experiment with light that shows that light has a wave-like nature. We can do these things with quantum particles as well, and um, they display wave-like characteristics because we can see interference. Uh, sorry, something's come up asking me to update Apple software. Let me, um, <laughs> I'll just minimize it. Okay, let's carry on. Um, <clears throat> okay, and um, in particular, um, if we do these experiments one particle at a time, we still see these interference effects. So this gives evidence for the fact that it's not the fact that um, some particles are going through one slit, some particles are going through the other, and there's some sort of joint interference effect. It's really that every quantum particle has a wave associated with it, which, um, yes, is a little bit strange um, for students to get their head around the first time they see this, um, but this is the experimental evidence for for our belief that that is the case. And so if we send these particles through um, one, uh, one particle at a time, what happens? Um, well, at first, let's turn this pointer again, at, at first it looks sort of random. So these particles hit the screen at random points, um, and uh, it, it sort of looks like a random pattern. And as you continue, you get these interference fringes built up. So you can start to see some of them here in this second picture where, where a little bit more particles have hit. A little bit more evidence of fringes here um, in, in this uh, next one. And here you can really see the interference fringes um, in the last one. And um, this gives us evidence for the fact that every quantum particle has a wave associated with it. So each quantum particle sometimes can behave in, in a wave-like, have wave-like behavior. Um, the other thing to note is that um, this wave associated with each quantum particle is something physical because it has observable consequences. So I'm not going to talk about um, the philosophy of what is this, this wave. Maybe you talked about that a little bit more um, in, the, in the double slit meet. Um, but just, just to note at this point that there is a wave associated with a quantum particle and it corresponds to something physical because it has observable consequences, which we can see in these interference experiments. So that's sort of our starting point, is that quantum particles have a, a wave-like nature. So they, they behave like waves. And once you sort of accept that, and um, one more thing, which I'll come to later, which is continuity, then um, the fact that tunneling can happen sort of follows quite naturally, I hope. <clears throat> so let's take a little detour to talk about what are these potential energy diagrams. Because when, when you see... Um, when you see in textbooks how quantum tunneling work, they always refer to these potential energy diagrams. So just to give um, students a little bit of intuition what these things mean, um, here's an example of a potential energy diagram. So um, on the x-axis is plotted distance, for example, and on the y-axis, um, the potential. So this could be an electric potential, for example, um, or a gravitational potential. 
Um, and to get an idea of uh, what this means, it's useful to talk about how would a particle behave if it was in this potential and had a certain amount of energy. Uh, one way to think about that is to think about the, the force. So um, uh, the gradient of the potential gives, gives you a force. And so, for example, if you had a particle sitting over here, uh, well, it has a negative gradient, so it's decreasing here. And so it experiences a force in this plus direction, so this way. Uh, similarly, if your particle was sitting over here, um, you have a, a slope in the positive direction, and so a force in the negative direction. So your, your particle is pushed this way. And so classically, what you would expect is your particle sitting here um, gets pushed this way, it gets pushed back again. And so you can see a sort of an oscillator. So here's your particle oscillating in this potential energy. Um, one example of such a potential energy is a gravitational one. And so sometimes it's useful to literally think of these things as being a landscape. And what would your particle do if it was in that landscape? So that can give some intuition as to, as to how a particle should behave in a potential. And indeed, um, the gravitational potential is, is exactly proportional to uh, the height. And so you really can think about uh, a particle sitting somewhere in this landscape, and what would it do? So if it sits up here, it would roll down and roll up the other side, and so on. So I'll try to give a couple of examples of um, uh, what potential, what these potential barriers are in, in different cases as we move on. OK, so um, the first part that um, quantum particles have a wave-like nature, um, the second part, how do particles behave in a, in a potential? And the third thing I want to stress is that um, physical quantities should be continuous things. So what do I mean by that? Um, what happens when a classical particle hits a barrier? So um, here's our potential barrier, brick wall. Um, you could think of um, this brick wall as, as a potential in a couple of different ways. So just to give you some intuition for, again, these sorts of diagrams. Um, you could think of this as a gravitational potential. So if you have a particle flying around in here and it's high enough, it can jump over this potential and get to the other side. Um, if it's not high enough, if it's bouncing around down here, um, it can't get over the potential. So this potential barrier corresponds to uh, gravity, corresponds to a height that your particle can't get over. And that's sort of a quite intuitive way of thinking about uh, what's going on and why, why your classical particle can't get from one side to the other. Um, the other way you could think about um, this, so another example of a potential that's, that's uh, represented by this, is um, physicists like to say that if you fall off a, a high building, it's not gravity that kills you, it's uh, electromagnetism. Uh, gravity makes you fall, but electromagnetism makes you stop. And um, the idea is that you have two solid bod bodies here. When one comes very close to the other, then the electromagnetic forces in there start to repel each other. And, uh, and they push each other away. So you could also think of this in another way as an electromagnetic potential. So when this solid object comes very close to this solid object, it gets repelled and pushed back again. OK, um, so what happens? In this quite idealized picture, um, our tennis ball comes in and hits the wall and uh, gets reflected, so it bounces back again. Um, and in this, this quite ideal picture, there's an instantaneous change in velocity at the barrier. So the ball comes in, is reflected, and bounces back again. Um, what really happens is um, a little bit more complicated than that. And you can see some quite nice videos on YouTube, actually, of, of a bouncing ball, uh, a rubber ball. And you can see this squashing against the wall, for example, here. So what really happens is the ball comes in. And um, the velocity change at the wall is, of course, not discontinuous. So you don't just quickly, uh, instantaneously change velocity from one direction to the other. Um, there's a, a fast but continuous change in velocity here. So um, our ball comes in, and you'll see some deformation if it's, if it's elastic, and then bounces back again. And what I really want, the point I really want to make here is that physical quantities um, are continuous. So um, although in some idealized case uh, it's useful to think of the velocity change as happening instantaneously, physical quantities actually are continuous, um, should be continuous. 
And um, this is sort of the second um, element of quantum tunneling, and I'll, I'll get to where this is, this is relevant next. But um, if you can accept that quantum particles sometimes behave like waves, and accept that the wave is something physical and therefore should be continuous, then actually tunneling is, is inevitable, I claim, which we'll get to next. So um, quantum mechanically, um, here's an example of, of a potential, uh, what's called a, a potential step. So what happens for a quantum particle experiencing this potential? Um, so again, let's talk about uh, classically what happens. So over here in this region, your particle has some energy. So think of your tennis ball as having some energy, which is a sum of its potential and kinetic energies. Over here, this is zero potential energy, so all its energy is kinetic, and uh, it's positive, so it's bouncing around at some velocity. Uh, over here, um, it doesn't have enough energy to get over this potential difference. So if it was to enter this region, there's a potential here which um, is too high, and it would have to have a negative kinetic energy, which, which doesn't make sense classically. So our particle can't get into this, what's called the classically forbidden region. Uh, quantum mechanically, um, what happens? So the first step is that um, over here we have what's called a free particle. So there's no, there's no potential here, it's all kinetic energy. And we know what a free quantum particle behaves like because we can do interference experiments. So we know that it has a wave-like nature. So over here, here's our particle um, oscillating away like a wave. Uh, what happens over here in the classically forbidden region? So my claim is that this wave associated with our particle represents something real, something physical. And so it can't just stop here at the boundary. So what does this wave represent? It tells us something about probabilities. What's the probability to find the particle in, in different regions? And that probability is always finite out here, and it can't simply disappear here at the boundary. And so the fact that it must represent something physical tells us that actually it must protrude a little bit here into this region that's not allowed classically. So just to um, try to go into that a little bit more, um, let's think about some limiting cases of this, this idea of a potential barrier. So um, if my particle is sitting uh, over here in this left region, um, this is a perfectly allowed region, and it, it has a positive kinetic energy. Um, as this barrier gets very, very wide, so think of, um, think of a very, very wide wall, um, we expect that um, the particle won't be able to pass through. So the, this limiting case of this barrier becoming very, very wide, we really do expect that we, we won't be able to find this particle um, way over here. The other limiting case of interest is when the barrier gets very, very narrow. So in the real limiting case where this barrier goes to zero, what do we expect to see? Well, the barrier is gone. So um, we have some probability that the particle is allowed to be over here, and it just continues into this region. So the probability that the particle is over here it is, is exactly continuous. Um, so what happens as this barrier gets narrower and narrower? So with a very wide barrier, so you could imagine this very wide wall, for example, um, we accept that the particle can't get through. But as the barrier gets narrower and narrower, then what happens? And as, as the barrier goes to zero, um, we know that the, the particle can pass through. Um, but if this, this barrier is very, 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 very narrow, so of the order of the wavelength of this quantum particle, um, then uh, we might expect, uh, because of continuity, that actually it can pass through. And so the idea is um, when this barrier becomes zero, uh, the particle cannot, uh, the particle can pass through uh, unhindered. Um, so how narrow does it have to be before the particle can get through at all? And, um, and that's why we expect there to be actually some fall off in here. So, so um, uh, as, as we increase this continuously, we expect there to be a, a continuous behavior across the boundary. So let me go back to this um, picture um, of quantum tunneling. 
And um, as I, I said previously, we sort of know what the particle's doing over here. So over here we have a region um, uh, where the particle is behaving like a free particle, and it has this wave-like behavior. Over here, if it's allowed to get here, it also has a wave-like behavior. And here in the middle, um, it's doing something funny. So we expect cont continuity. So we impose that it should be continuous here, and it should be continuous here. And um, we get that it has to be allowed to go into this region. And those of you who have more of a, an engineering background, you've seen probably something like this before, because this is just an evanescent wave. So what's happening in here in this region is, um, is just exactly a, a, an evanescent wave. So it's not something that propagates, it just, um, it just decays. OK. Um, and you know, there's a lot of math behind this. Um, you, you can look at um, the mathematical form of what are the allowed solutions of, of the, the wave equation, you get exactly this. But it really comes from um, just the, the requirement that uh, this, this wave function describing the particle should be continuous. So um, should be continuous across this boundary and across this one. So this doesn't tell us what the shape of this uh, function here in this region is, um, but it does tell us that it should protrude into that region. And um, if you've come across evanescent waves, you may have come across the fact that they fall, they fall off very quickly. In fact, they fall off exponentially. And so this probability here, this wave, falls off exponentially as a function of the barrier width. Um, and so this is sort of as good as you can get to discontinuous. So you expect it to be zero when this is very narrow. Uh, when it's very, uh, very narrow, you expect it to just pass through. When it's very wide, you expect it to not pass through at all. And so um, when it's somewhere in between, we expect this probability to fall off very quickly. And so remember, the amplitude squared of this wave represents um, a probability. And that's falling off exponentially. Uh, this is the region where a classical particle can't be because it doesn't have enough energy. And, and quantum mechanically, the probability of being there falls off exponentially. And um, if you go a little bit more into the mathematics of it, um, you, you can show explicitly that this is an exponential fall off. Um, so that's more detail than you need for the sort of um, conceptual what's going on here. Um, but it's, uh, it is a feature of the quantum tunneling effect that um, the probability of tunneling falls off exponentially with the barrier width. And this means it's very, very sensitive to barrier width, um, which turns out to be useful for various applications, which um, we'll talk about later. So um, the fall off, this exponential fall off, depends on um, the width of the barrier. So as the barrier gets wider, it falls off very quickly. Oops, I have trouble with this pointer. Uh, and also uh, the energy difference. So if my particle has some set energy E and this barrier is, is at height V0, then um, it, the bigger that gap, the faster this probability falls off. So the, the smaller the probability of finding the particle out here. So um, a particle which doesn't have enough energy to get across the barrier, uh, quantum mechanically has some non-zero probability of being found in here, uh, in a region which is classically forbidden. Uh, and, and indeed, if you start a particle on the left-hand side of the barrier, it even has a non-zero probability of getting through to the right, uh, something that's not possible classically. And how does this um, behave? It behaves exponentially. So the probability falls off exponentially as the width gets bigger. So it's very, very sensitive um, to the width of this barrier. OK, um, so the, the phenomenon of tunneling um, comes about because of the wave-like nature of um, quantum particles. And it's really a wave effect. And you can see it, indeed, in other wave systems. Um, so in light, for example, um, and in acoustics. And um, the example of total internal reflection is sort of nice because um, it's uh, something that, that your students probably will have seen already, um, refraction and internal, internal reflection at an interface. 
And uh, it gives the idea that this this effect, this tunneling effect, is not just a quantum effect, but is because because of the wave-like nature of, of quantum particles. Um, so um, uh, Snell's law, of course, tells us about how quant how light refracts at an interface, how light bends. And you know, as you increase the angle past a critical angle, at some point the refracted ray um, disappears, the transmitted ray. And you only get a reflected ray. You get total internal reflection. Um, now, this is all in a, a ray, ray picture, a geometrical optics picture, um, which works very well when um, the wave-like nature of light isn't important. Uh, but actually, light is a wave, and so there's a little bit more going on than just, um, just this, this ray picture. And so um, this is something that students will have come across, uh, and then you, you can give a little bit more detail in terms of what's happening with the, with the wave-like picture. So um, how is how is this um, relevant to the quantum tunneling um, effect? Uh, you can have frustrated total internal reflection. So um, here's our uh, on the left a picture of uh, total internal reflection and what's really happening when you look at the full wave-like picture. So yes, there is a reflection at the boundary. Um, here's our incoming wave that gets totally internally reflected here. Um, but actually, the wave penetrates just a little bit into this other region out here. So this is our um, material of high, reflective index, high refractive index. And this, for example, is air. And um, at the interface, we choose the angle such that you get totally in total internal reflection here. Um, but there's a little bit of what's called an evanescent wave. Um, here at the surface. And an evanescent wave doesn't propagate, uh, but it does, it does exist there. So there is, there is an electric field here, non-zero electric field, but it's not a propagating one. And this is exactly the same effect as in quantum mechanics. Um, the electromagnetic field here at the boundary um, falls off uh, exponentially, um, but it's not discontinuous. So that is, um, here's my electric field coming in here, getting reflected. It doesn't simply stop here, it does continue a little bit, a little way in, but it falls off very quickly. It falls off exponentially, what's happening here. Um, and uh, you, can, you can show this in a two prism setup. Um, so here's my prism set up for total internal reflection. Uh, here's my incoming light beam and my outgoing light beam. And this is the, the ray picture, so we get our total internal reflection like this. But actually, I don't know if you can see a tiny little pink blob there, um, which indicates that our electric field actually propagates just a little bit into this region um, in, in an evanescent wave. And how you can see that is if we stick another prism on the other side. So if we stick another prism on the other side, very close to this first one, and if it's close enough, then um, what's an evanescent wave here it can become a propagating one again in this medium. And so um, where we previously had um, no output uh, here, no transmitted wave, now we can see a transmitted wave. And this is very, very sensitive to the distance here between the prisons. And uh, Gregor had some fun trying to um, get these close enough to be able to show this. And uh, I'll, I'll just maybe show you a, a video of that now. What we have here is a class 2 laser diode module set up to show total internal reflection inside this semicircular block. There's a second semicircular block and it's close to the first but it isn't touching. I've put a little bit of foil in there to keep them very slightly apart. Now the effect we're looking for here only occurs over very very small distances, thousandths of a millimetre. We've also got two bits of card here which will let us see where the laser beam is and we see here that it's ending up reflecting and coming out here and we see it in this card. I'm now going to put the lights off and I'm going to squeeze these semicircular blocks so that they become ever closer together. Pay particular attention to what's happening here. So here we go, I'll give the blocks a squeeze 
and we see that as we squeeze, I'll do it again, more and more light is transmitted through and we see it on this card here. Lovely. So, um, so you can see there an example of at least an analogy um, to quantum tunneling. And it again shows this idea of um, that, that something should be continuous at a boundary. So when you push those two prisms together, um, when they're all the way touching, if they're really flush against one another, you expect this ray to, to be transmitted, to go right through, because there's no change in the refractive index at the boundary. So how close do these prisms really have to be together for, for them to be considered touching? And it, it turns out that they don't have to be quite all the way together for there to be some transmission. And that's because of this um, tunneling effect. So this existence of an evanescent wave um, which can then couple through uh, the other prism. Um, so this is, um, they do need to be quite close together. Um, this falls off exponentially, as we said, so it's, um, you need about, about a wavelength, the order of a few wavelengths here in between the, the prisms. So what you can do, and what I think Gregor did for that um, demonstration, is stick a little piece of foil between one end of, of the, the prisms so that they're not actually touching. Um, <clears throat> and then push your two, two prisms together and see how the uh, transmitted wave changes um, as the prisms get closer and closer together. So um, that's uh, really an exact analogy to what happens in the quantum tunneling case, um, but, uh, but an example using a different kind of wave, so using um, a light wave instead. <clears throat> So uh, uh, another example um, of quantum tunneling occurs in um, alpha decay. And um, this was one of the first places where it was realized that, that tunneling was um, important in a physical process. And so the idea is that within the nucleus, um, you have a strong nuclear force, um, but it's very short range. So um, there's a, a very large negative potential associated with this strong nuclear force. So um, within a large nucleus, I've got all these nucleons held together um, by, this, by the strong force. And um, some nucle nuclei can decay by alpha decay, as you know. Um, an alpha particle is consists of um, two protons and two neutrons. And you can think of it as being a particle itself within the nucleus. So it sort of acts like um, a single body of um, two protons and two ne neutrons. So in here, um, it's very tightly bound um, by the strong force to the, the rest of the nucleus. Um, <clears throat> as uh, the distance of the alpha particle to the other nucleons increases, this is what our potential energy looks like. So this part is the very strong nuclear force. If it was to get out here, it would be governed by um, the Coulomb force, um, which is repulsive because um, this is positive and the other nucleon, this is positively charged, as is the rest of the nucleus. Um, <clears throat> but in between, there's this big potential barrier to get over. So um, this particular potential energy diagram comes from, this, this contribution comes from the strong nuclear force, which is the, the strong force, which is very strong, but also very short range. And this bit out here comes from um, the Coulomb force, which is longer range and um, repulsive. So if I have an a alpha particle sitting here in the nucleus with this energy, um, classically it wouldn't be able to get across this boundary. So it's, it's stuck in there um, in the nucleus forever. But we know that some nuclei are not stable and can decay by alpha particles. And how they do this is through quantum tunneling. So out here, the particle does have enough, uh, the alpha particle does have enough energy to exist out here. Um, the problem is getting over this barrier here, and it does that by quantum tunneling. And um, Helen's made a nice video of that, which I guess will be available um, online as well. Um, another example is given by this quantum tunneling composite, um, which uh, Gregor um, has some examples of and, and told me about recently. And this is really quite nice. So this is a material which has quite interesting um, resistive properties. So um, its resistant resistance to electrical current changes dramatically when you apply pressure. 
And how it's made is um, there's all these, so this is, a, a, I guess, a scanning tunneling microscope image of such a thing. Um, we'll come to the scanning tunneling microscope next. Uh, but this is made of these little particles of conductors um, within an insulating material. And um, <clears throat> so, so these little uh, regions here are conductive, so um, electrons can flow across them. But the medium in which they're sitting is insulating, so electrons can't, um, can't flow through, a uh, current can't flow through. Um, what happens when you apply a little bit of pressure is you push these particles, these little um, uh, conducting particles closer together, and um, they get close enough that the electrons can tunnel across the, the, across the gap. So um, one way to think about it is to get out of one of these little conducting particles, you need to be able to give the electrons a little bit of energy. Um, so the, the, if you've talked about the, the photoelectric effect, for example, you know that um, uh, electrons need to receive enough energy, this work function of a material, to escape the material. And so here's our conducting material with electrons in it. In order to get away from that, they need at least the amount of energy, this work function, to jump uh, to um, get across, get off of the surface and, and through the insulator. And now if I have two of these particles close together, um, I have a large potential um, energy that I need to give it in order to get across. But over here, my particle has enough energy to, to live over here in this other conducting particle. And so this is what the potential barrier is in this case. It's this work function, this amount of energy I need to give the electron to get it up, up, across, um, to get it off the conductor. And so when I push these things together, um, I, I can, uh, the electrons can tunnel across from one little conducting particle to another uh, using quantum tunneling. And because this is so sensitive to uh, the distance between them because of this exponential fall off, um, this particular material is very sensitive to uh, applying pressure. And I think we have another nice little video of how this quantum tunneling composite um, behaves. This little black pellet here is made of a material called QTC, which is short for quantum tunneling composite. It's a mixture of a resin with tiny spiky metal granules in it. And you can see that it's sitting on top of a piece of aluminium, which is of course a conductor. Here's a shaft also made of the same material. And I'm going to place that on top of the QTC so that the QTC is sandwiched in there and the shaft and the base there are connected to an ohmmeter. So what we're doing here is we're measuring the resistance of the QTC. Now at the setting it's at just now, you'll see it's off the scale. And even if I go right up to its highest setting, it goes off the scale as well. However, if I press on here, apply a force to it, you'll see the resistance goes down. And in fact, even if I go to its lowest setting and I press, I can get the resistance down to only a few ohms less than one in fact. Now this behaviour, if we actually investigate, say using a stack of masses here, the variation of resistance with force, we get a relationship that cannot be described using classical physics. So um, just a, a, another example of a, a case in which um, quantum tunneling is uh, important. And uh, so this resistance of, or rather the conductivity, um, depends very sensitively on um, the pressure applied to the material, um, which, is, which is quite a cool use of, of quantum tunneling. And so these sorts of materials have been proposed for use in, in touchscreens, for example, and, and various other um, applications. <clears throat> And the last example I wanted to mention, which is quite important, um, is the scanning tunneling microscope. And these things can achieve really um, nanoscale resolution. So you can pick out um, single atoms on the surface of, uh, of a material using a scanning tunneling microscope. And um, really depends, as the name suggests, so heavily on uh, the phenomenon of quantum tunneling.
Um, it's also been 35 years since the scanning tunneling microscope was first um, suggested. And so um, there's some various special issues of, of various physics journals at the moment about this. Um, so how does it work? Um, it depends um, crucially on this phenomenon of quantum tunneling. Um, how exactly does it work? So here's a, a schematic of a scanning tunneling microscope. And the idea is I have this tip, which I scan across the surface of the sample. And essentially, electrons can sometimes tunnel from the surface of the um, sample into this tip and then be registered as a current. And so by, by scanning the tip across the surface and measuring the current, I can learn something about um, the, uh, what that surface looks like. Um, and because this tunneling effect is so sensitive uh, to distance, then I get really very good resolution with such an instrument. And just to come back to this idea of what are these potential barriers, in this case, the potential barrier, again, is given by this work function. So here's my sample. I need to give the electrons a certain amount of energy to release them from the surface of this sample. And so by uh, keeping the tip at a potential difference compared to the sample, well, I need to provide a potential for the electrons to be released from the sample. Um, I can keep this at that same potential. And so there's a potential uh, a barrier in the middle. So um, my sample is, a, is at a certain potential. Uh, my tip is kept at a potential by this, by this tunneling voltage. And um, the electrons in the material have enough energy to live here in the tip, but not to get across. And so that's why um, they need to tunnel across this barrier, um, which, is, which is due to air being insulating, basically. <clears throat> Um, so because this is so sensitive to, to, because tunneling is so sensitive to the distance, this is a really sensitive instrument. Um, and here's how, how it works usually in practice. So you, you measure this photocurrent. Um, in practice, what, what's usually done is um, you, we, we can move the tip of this. So this is a schematic again. Um, here's our sample. And here are the electrons in the tip. And this is to... Um, to denote that the, the electrons are tunneling across. Um, you, you can move this tip uh, across the surface and uh, par uh, perpendicular to the surface. And uh, usually what's done is you scan the tip across the surface of the sample and also move it uh, perpendicular to the surface to keep the current constant. And uh, by measuring how much you need to move it, you can get, then get some information about um, the surface. So if this needle is close enough to the surface, then electrons can tunnel across and can be detected as a, as a current. And we move this in order to maintain a constant tunneling current. Um, and uh, so, so we can get resolution with these that wouldn't be possible, of course, with any um, optical techniques. And here's an example of a, a DNA image um, achieved using scanning tunneling microscope. Um, so this has been a really important technology and was awarded the Nobel Prize um, uh, 30 years ago in, in 1986. <clears throat> so um, that, that's the, the sort of four examples of when tunneling is important. One is a, an analogy, um, so to show tunneling as being a, an effect, a wave effect, um, you, can, you can show the equivalent, an analogy using light. <clears throat> um, and the others are really quantum tunneling effects and, and where they're important. Um, so what is, just, just to, to recap, what is quantum tunneling? Um, what we mean by it is when a quantum particle can pass through a barrier that we wouldn't be able to pass through classically. Um, it's not something that's peculiar to quantum particles uh, as such. It's, it's a wave effect. Um, so it's a consequence of the fact that quantum particles have a wave-like nature. And so as I, as I mentioned, you can see this in other wave systems. Um, it also arises due to the fact that physical quantities should be continuous. And so if we have some non-zero probability in some region, um, we can't have it just uh, abruptly going to zero at, at a boundary. And so it turns out uh, in the wave picture, this wave needs to protrude a little bit into that, that barrier, and we get an evanescent wave. <clears throat> um, in this classically forbidden region, so within a, ba a barrier, and the probability 
of finding a particle decays approximately exponentially. And so the probability of tunneling decays exponentially um, with the width of the barrier. So um, it's really sensitive uh, to the width of this barrier, um, which is useful in various applications. And um, this analogy in light, it's quite a nice analogy as given by frustrated, what's called frustrated total internal reflection, which is where we can couple evanescent waves um, from, one, from one prism into another. And this is how you, for example, couple um, adjacent waveguides. So if you, if you bring two waveguides closer together, you can couple the light from one into the other using the evanescent field. Um, <clears throat> so um, that's it. Um, thank you. <laughs> thank you for listening. And, uh, and thank you again to um, Helen and Gregor um, for the, the nice videos. Can we take any questions through the chat board then? Yes, sure. <laughs> um, so if there are any questions through the chat board? Yeah, so <clears throat> um, mathematically, when we, we go through the, the solution of, of the equation that describes quantum particles, the thing that makes the difference is that the fact that um, this wave function has to be continuous across the boundary. And, and the reason it has to be continuous is because it represents something physical. Um, so the wave function and its derivative represent physical measurable quantities. So the wave function itself represents probability. And um, the reason it has to be continuous actually is because the way in which it changes also represents something physical, uh, which is um, momentum. And so if this, this wave was allowed to change discontinuously across the boundary, that means there's a jump in the value of the wave function. And at that point, the rate of change of it is no longer defined, is no longer well defined. But this rate of change represents something physical also, which is the momentum. And so the momentum becomes undefined at that point, um, which is not allowed. So that's, that's another way in, in the quantum case of understanding why this um, thing has to be continuous. Um, but really, in, in general, um, when you think about physical quantities, so you know sometimes we have this idealization that things change um, instantaneously, like this velocity. Um, at, at, at a wall, but when you really break it down into what's actually happening, um, it's always a, a continuous process. I hope that helps. Yeah, okay. Um, so you can think of it in terms of, of, tunnel, of the uncertainty principle. Um, it's not my favorite way to think about it. Um, so, so people use this analogy of the idea that um, you can borrow a certain amount of, of energy as long as you only borrow it for a short amount of time. And that's, that's sort of where the uncertainty principle comes in. So um, if you borrow an amount of energy delta E, then because of the uncertainty principle, delta E delta T has to be greater than or equal to H bar over 2. And so, sorry, thanks constant divided by 4 pi. I know we use H4 all the time, but uh, I don't know if you guys do. Um, so, so it's bounded. So the, the product of the uncertainty in energy and the uncertainty in time um, is bounded from below. And so um, there's this idea that you can, if you, if you don't have enough energy to get across a barrier, you can borrow a little amount of energy, delta E, as long as you only borrow it for a time, delta T. So that's, that's sort of where the uncertainty principle sometimes comes in. Yeah, so, so exactly, this is related to the point about the uncertainty principle. Um, so it, if you consider a particle to have a, a fixed energy, um, <clears throat> then you can make this argument that it can sometimes borrow enough energy as long as it only does that for an amount of time that satisfies the uncertainty principle. Okay. Um, yeah, can you say you were thinking of the uncertainty principle? Okay. No. 
Yeah, so so exactly the, the uncertainty principle. Um, you can argue that you you can borrow sort of borrow this amount of energy delta e as long as it's only for a certain amount of time. And um, of course, there's no there, yeah as you say there's no breaking of conservation of energy. There's this weird thing where when the particle is in this barrier region, it has apparently a negative kinetic energy. Um, so we don't know what that would mean classically. So that's why it's forbidden classically. Um, but quantum mechanically, we, we can write down something that makes sense, at least mathematically, and it's this evanescent wave solution. Um, so, but, but conservation of energy um, doesn't, doesn't break down, which is good. <laughs> yes, yeah, Steph, yeah. Um, yeah, sorry, I, I should have been a little bit more explicit about about exactly what the wave um, represents, but but the idea is once once we've accepted that these waves exist and that we can see interference effects, we know what happens um, in the region where there's no potential, and uh, it, the particle behaves like this oscillating wave. Um, so the the regions on the left and the right where um, the potential is zero is simply um, this oscillating wave, and exactly it's the probability amplitude is the thing that. That oscillates. So the square of that is the thing that gives you a probability or um, something physical that you can measure. And so the idea that this wave is falling off exponentially means that its probability uh, of finding it there is also falling off exponentially. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Can Gregor give us a few tricks of the page? Uh, yes, Helen, I don't, hope you can hear me there, Helen. Uh, I've written that experiment up, and it isn't on our website yet, but it will be in the next couple of weeks at the latest. Plus, we've also got uh, how to do QTC experiments as well. QTC. Um, you can buy QTC from Mindsets online, but um, SciChem sell a QTC test rig, the one that you saw in the video there, and it comes with uh, a little piece of QTC, so straight out of the box you can be doing QTC experiments. And it's quite nice because if you stack masses on top of it, then you get a fairly exponential looking graph. Uh, I would need to talk to you a little more about it, but you can see that it's certainly not a linear decrease in resistance you might expect from a classical and uh, classical explanation of shoving particles together so that they touch. <laughs>